So when you're first starting to work on PCBs a bit more seriously, maybe your design has USB or some other semi-fast interface. You're normally thinking that the faster the speed of the signal, the harder it is to work with. Then when you first hear about EMI or EMC issues, you really think the faster the data rate, the worse those issues become. That's all super logical sounding, right? Well, what if I told you that often a much more significant contributing factor on whether a trace will radiate or not isn't the raw data rate, but the rise time of the signals? Let me show you what I mean. So before I get into the meat of this video, it was recently brought to my attention that on the first EMC for Everyone series, I never really explained what EMC or EMI is and why it's important. Now, I don't wanna bore anybody who already knows, so I'm going to throw that in at the end of this video. So go ahead and check that out right now if you're interested. Also, just as a reminder, I'll have a supplemental video that goes along with this video and all other EMC videos up on my Patreon. That video will add a lot more information, especially on the why of these topics. So figuring out how to properly test the effect of rise time on a signal radiating was really tough. I went through literally three or four different designs and different ICs until I found one that worked. I needed to have an IC that has a really fast rise time and has a controllable frequency. Of course, bonus points for any IC that was easy to use and didn't require a lot of supporting components. I finally settled on an LTC 6905, which is a variable frequency oscillator. Certain versions allow the adjustment of the master frequency with just a resistor. And then using an input pin, it can be changed from VCC, floating, or ground to divide that master out. Unbeknownst to me, I somehow ordered the fixed master frequency version at 96 megahertz. So using the divider, I had the choice of 96, 48, or 24 megahertz, which is still plenty. The main reason I went with this part, other than the fact that it's super easy to use, is the specified rise time. The data sheet specifies a rise time of half a nanosecond with a five picofarad load capacitor. Its CMOS driver also allows it to drive really large loads for an oscillator. Now, to be able to actually check and measure the rise time accurately, you would likely need at least a gigahertz bandwidth oscilloscope, if not much higher, which we don't have here. So I'm not going to be able to confirm what the actual rise time is, but we really don't care, only that it's pretty low. The schematic for the test board is quite simple. It has three identical blocks, all based on the LTC 6905. Each block has two 2.2 microfarad 0402 decoupling capacitors, an adjustable jumper on the divide pin, and a voltage divider on the set pin. Again, I thought this was the adjustable master clock version, so that's why the divider is there. I ended up just shorting it out and removing the potentiometer altogether, so it's not actually being used. The output pin goes through a series resistor that we can use to adjust the rise time of the signal. It then drives a 10K resistor in parallel with a one picofarad capacitor. To test the common mode currents that are coupled to a stray wire on the board, I also included a single wire with five volt in ground, leaving the board through a differential and common mode filter. The filtering won't be used on this video, but for a future topic. That wire then extends a couple feet out onto the test surface. On the PCB, I tried my best to have each of the three blocks laid out exactly the same to be able to compare each of them in a future video. For this video, I'm only going to be using the furthest south block. I forgot to include jumpers on the power line to disconnect power to the other ICs, so I just cut and removed the trace from the top two, so only the bottom IC has power. The only difference between the three blocks is the addition of a progressively larger return path discontinuity in the bottom ground plane. I purposefully didn't add a top ground pour, so all return currents are forced to a known location. I chose the south block for this video as any impact from the changes I'll be making will be amplified by that return path discontinuity. I'll discuss the impact and why that discontinuity has such a big impact in the supplemental video. So the most effective method for checking the emission from any single trace is to use what's called a near field probe. These probes pick up the electromagnetic radiation emitted from a trace in the near field. This includes both magnetic H field and electric E fields. 
It is critical to understand that any measurement taken from a near field probe is strictly qualitative. It cannot be directly related to any EM compliance standard. The reason for this I'll better cover in the supplemental video, but the long and short of it is that in the near field, the electromagnetic field is primarily dictated by the circuit impedance, with either the E field or the H field being dominant independently, while in the far field, they act as a real electromagnetic wave with both the E and the H field supporting each other. Just because a signal radiates in the near field, it does not mean it will radiate in the far field. For these near field tests, I marked a spot on the top of the board directly over where the plane discontinuity is located. Using an E field probe, I use the exact same spot for every single test. A really useful real world pre-compliance measuring tool is an RF current clamp. In fact, Henry Ott stated in his famous EMC book that it's actually the single most important pre-compliance test that you can do. The reason why is pretty simple. First, it's a really easy test to do. You don't need any sort of complex testing environment and it doesn't take long to complete. Second, as I've stated a lot in the past, in order to have radiated emissions, you need both an energy source and an antenna. Cables leaving your board are typically several times longer than any trace on your board, so they have a much, much greater chance of becoming an effective antenna due to their size. So these probes measure the amount of common mode current that is flowing in and out of a cable. And to be clear, common mode current is always unintended as it isn't the actual signal that is being driven. It can be really confusing and I'm planning on doing several videos of common mode currents in the future, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss them. So using the results of the clamp, there are correlation tables that can be used to convert the power of the RF energy to an actual current, and then what are the current limits at a given frequency to stay below an emission standard. So this really is one of the best tests to quantifiably determine if a device will pass or fail a radiated emissions test. Now I haven't gone through and set up the correlations yet, so I'm just going to be using the raw data from the clamp just as another data point to be able to qualitatively compare how the changing series resistors affects the emission. So when I originally started doing these tests, I started with the zero ohm series resistor. I used an E-field probe, but I placed it in between the IC and the series resistor. It was a really easy place in which to index the probe at. To make sure that it was a good location, I moved the probe all along the trace, making sure that the values were roughly the same, which they were. Maybe you can see the error in this approach, which at the time I certainly did not. So I did this test for both 96 and 24 megahertz with series resistor values of 0 ohms, 220 ohms, and 10 kilo ohms. I recorded all the data while doing this, but I didn't really try to interpret the data while doing the tests. Once all the tests were completed, I started analyzing the data. What I found was incredibly confusing to me. There was next to no change in the power when changing the series resistors. There was only like a two dB UV reduction in each harmonic from the zero ohm to the 10K. I was thinking this was gonna be a really lame video with a really confusing conclusion until I realized where I was measuring at. The series resistor does not really affect the EM fields produced from the IC to the series resistor, as the rise time there will still be very fast. It only affects what's on the other side of the series resistor. This shows something really important to keep in mind when using series resistors, which I'll come back to later in the video. So with my newfound insight gain from the first testing failure, I then placed the probe in what was now the correct location right above the plane discontinuity and redid all of the tests. Once again, the tests were with a zero ohm, 220 ohm, and a 10 kilo ohm resistor, each tested at 24 and 96 megahertz. I started with a zero ohm resistor using the E-field probe. What is really neat is that you can clearly see that only the odd harmonics have any substantial energy, which is completely expected with a 50% duty cycle square wave. The fundamental frequency of 96 megahertz is at 40 dBUV. The third harmonic at 288 megahertz is 42 dBUV. The fifth harmonic at 480 megahertz is 38 dBUV. 
and the ninth harmonic at 864 megahertz is 40 db uv what is important to note is how up until the ninth harmonic the power really doesn't roll off at all after the ninth harmonic it starts to roll off pretty quickly now switching to a 220 ohm series resistor the 96 megahertz fundamental frequency has a power of 41 db uv the third harmonic is 37 db uv fifth harmonic is 34 db uv and ninth harmonic is 22 db uv here the fundamental frequency has basically the same power as was with the zero ohm but after that the power starts to roll off linearly the final resistor value is a 10k which of course is not super realistic but i chose it still to show a really dramatic difference the fundamental is 20 db uv third harmonic 15 db uv after this the power rolls off below the peak table limit doing the same test at 24 megahertz shows the exact same behavior the peaks are much closer together and while that makes it look a lot scarier it's just because the harmonics at 24 megahertz are much closer spaced than at 96 megahertz the zero ohm resistor shows very little roll off the 220 ohm shows a linear roll off and the 10 kilo ohm shows basically no power whatsoever I'm only going to show the RF current clamp test at 96 megahertz because the results are pretty much the same at 24 megahertz. The difference between the zero ohm and 220 ohm resistor doesn't show a whole lot of difference in the fundamental or the third harmonic. This seems to agree with what the near field probes results were as the 220 ohm series resistor didn't really help until some of the higher order harmonics which in neither resistor value have much power whatsoever on the cable. At 10K, I had to turn on the preamp as there was no signal without it. With the preamp on, there's a lot of background noise as would be expected, but unfortunately there was for some reason a background spike at just about 96 megahertz. So it's really hard to tell what the actual value is, but suffice to say that the 10K series resistor effectively removes all meaningful amount of CM current in the cable. Before discussing the results, the first thing I need to point out is since I can't confirm the rise or fall time of the signal, it isn't really a fair comparison between the 24 and 96 megahertz signals. So while we absolutely can compare trends in the data, we can't compare the absolute power of a specific harmonic when the IC is clocked at 24 megahertz versus 96 megahertz. For the rest of the discussion, I'll just be showing and talking about the 96 megahertz clock test since, again, it's much easier to view and the 24 megahertz signal shows the exact same trend. Based on the Fourier transform of a trapezoidal square wave, which is what all real world square waves are, there is a term that is based on the harmonic response of the waveform and another that is based on the rise and the fall time. Without going through and calculating or plotting the entire Fourier series, all you really need to know is that the power decreases from the fundamental frequency linearly at a rate of 20 dB per decade until it reaches the point where the frequency is equal to one over pi times the rise time. At that point, the power decreases at a rate of negative 40 dB per decade. So by increasing the rise time, adding series resistors whenever possible, you lower the frequency at which the negative 40 dB per decade term is applied. That effectively decreases the bandwidth of the emission. What's interesting is in my test, we can certainly see the drastic effect that increasing the series resistors has on the higher order harmonics. For most of the test, the power is pretty flat for a number of harmonics then it starts to decrease. In theory, it should always decrease from the fundamental frequency and then double the rate of decrease when it hits the one over pi times rise time term. Do be aware that's only the case for a 50% duty cycle square wave, which we have. I don't really know why this is the case. I'm gonna talk about a few thoughts that I have in the supplemental video, but definitely if you have any ideas or thoughts on the matter, please let me know. So with all that Fourier talk out of the way, what does this practically mean? Well, it means that while there certainly is an impact of the fundamental frequency, 
especially when considering detection types other than peak, which I was using, like quasi-peak, which I'll cover in a later video, the rise time of a signal is much more important when trying to limit EM radiation. Whenever possible, you should use series resistors to slow down the rise time of signals. Of course, you can't always do that, and I would not claim you could, but oftentimes digital ICs will have a much faster rise time than is required. If you're using a shift register or an I2C expander and you're driving some LEDs, you don't need to have a 20 nanosecond rise time. As I mentioned, when I initially tested with the probe in between the IC and the series resistor, there was basically no impact of changing the resistor value. This shows, as you would expect, that it is crucial to have the distance from the driving IC and the series resistor as short and close as possible. Since that trace will radiate as if there was no resistor, you want to reduce the size of its antenna, its loop area, as much as possible. So that wraps up the core topic of this video. Now I'll touch on what I missed in the introduction video somehow. <laughs> what is EMC or what is EMI? According to Henry Ott, EMC, electromagnetic compatibility, is one, the ability of an electronic system to function properly in its intended electromagnetic environment, and two, not be a source of pollution to the electromagnetic environment. So in a nutshell, EMC is all about making sure that your widget does not radiate or conduct emissions to the world and also not be affected by any outside emissions. Radiated emissions are those that leave the board or cables as electromagnetic waves propagating in the free space air around us. Conducted emissions are those that leave our widget through the input power cable affecting other devices on the power network. EMI or electromagnetic interference is simply any form of electromagnetic noise that negatively affects our widget. As a quick aside, the term EMC is often used to talk about electromagnetic compliance when speaking about compliance testing. While not perfectly accurate, it still does work okay in that context and you'll, you'll hear me talk about it like that. Now the most important question, why is EMC important? Why would you spend time watching my videos? Why would you try to fix issues that don't seem to affect your widget's performance? Well, there's three main reasons. First, in most countries, any electronic device with a speed faster than tens of kilohertz requires by law some form of EMC testing to be legally able to sell. Second, as a generalization, a board that emits EM noise is also susceptible to it. So by designing for EMC, you will have a more robust widget being more immune to outside noise, ESD events, etc. Finally, virtually all concepts that I'll be talking about and are considered good practice for EMC is also good practice for circuit design as a whole. So keeping EMC in mind, you'll tend to have better signal integrity, lower analog signal noise, and a better circuit overall. So that wraps up the conclusion, explanation, introduction part of the video. I really hope you guys enjoyed, and since this is really the first real video in this series, please let me know in the comments what you think. If there's any suggestions, anything you liked, didn't like, please let me know. And if you're interested, the link to the supplemental video will be up above in one of the corners and down in the description. And until then, I will see you in the next video.